can you say after an intro like that? So it's Monday, it's Monday night, forget Netflix. Uh, this is uh, whiskey on a Monday evening to be appreciated. Uh, forget Nature Watch, this is rare by nature. My name is Colin Dunn. I've got an opportunity to talk to you with some of my friends about this year's special releases, rare by nature, that we release every year between September and October. <clears throat> this year, it's almost like a culmination of last year's. So the actual whiskies, the distilleries we used last year are the same. But there's a couple of things I'd like to mention before we start. Um, number one, all of these whiskies are at cast strength. They're raw, they're un uncut, and they are exuding some massive flavor congeners, but also the alcohol may be a little bit too much if you were to drink all eight in one go. So I'm suggesting two things before we start. Number one, you've got copious amounts of water. Um, just to give you an idea, this morning uh, at eight o'clock when I went through uh, these for the first time, um, I thought seven of them needed water for my palate to bring out the best of the whiskey. And for me, I'm often asked how much water for me. I normally add about five or six droplets. So I suggest at the beginning, um, please feel free to have a sip. You have got enough though to come back to try them individually if you do want to taste them uh, all at cask strength. Um, the second thing to mention is of this selection of uh, whiskies that you're about to try, five are from Speyside, one is from Isla, one is from Sky, and one is from the Central Highlands. So effectively, uh, the four corners of the Scottish or the Diageo uh, whiskey universe. So um, I'd like to just mention um, William Shakespeare, who once said that uh, alcohol can provoketh the mind, but taketh away the performance. So with that in mind, don't forget copious amounts of water in between each of these expressions and adding a few drops after the initial nosing, you will see uh, the whiskey coming alive. So without further ado, um, I'm going to be tasting these, uh, comparing and contrasting them two at a time. So we're doing two times two times two times two to simplify it. The first two whiskies that we're going to be tasting together, uh, and if you're uh, able to at home, if you have two glasses, um, I'd love for you to be able to pour out. In my left hand, um, I have Cardu, uh, and in my right hand, I have uh, Crag and Moor, so that we can compare the two. I think it's always really good fun to compare and contrast so that you can um, smell as well as taste the differences. Uh, the second two I'll be working out together will be uh, Pitchy Vacant Dalwini. Uh, the third two will be uh, two from the Shades of Spey, one Mortlach and one Singleton. And then we're finishing off uh, with the, uh, the islands and Isla. We have uh, Talisker and we have uh, Lagavulin. So without further ado, I'd like you, um, if you're joining us, thank you very much on this Monday evening. I'd like you to pick up whiskey, uh, the first whiskey, which is Cardu. And this year, the Cardu that we're presenting to the public is an 11-year-old Cardu. And for me, um, I like the fact that they are playing around with wood management. <laughs> if you go back about 20 years, wood management didn't really exist. Companies would phone up the bodegas in Spain and say, give me 100 barrels, sherry barrels. And they could be anything. They could be Fino, Oloroso, you name it. Nowadays, each company employs people just to talk about wood. And here with Cardu, uh, we are using, or they have used that Cardu for maturation purposes, um, refill American oak, new American oak, and um, ex-bourbon casks that have come together to produce that classic Cardu nose. So just on the nose, when I nosed it this morning, I always find with Cardu that it's almost like a, it's quite a gentle whiskey. It's a summer whiskey. Um, I always tend to get notes of honey and toffee and fudge. And it's very, very drinkable. And the, the slumbering spice notes don't attack you. They literally 
come in and play with you. So I'm just going to take a very, very small nose and a very small drop. Now this comes in at 51% alcohol, which for me is too much. So you can see that I'm going to be adding just a few drops to this 11 year old expression in the Rare by Nature series. And now the aroma has really opened up now. It's incredibly fresh, it's young. The fieriness has been toned down by the water and let's every let's all just give it a little taste. That hits the spot. I can see. Actually, I'm, I would add me personally one or two more drops. You get that slumbering spice coming in on the back palate. This with something like lemon sponge cake would be absolutely spot on. Um, but I'm being joined on this particular um, tranche, these two uh, great space side distilleries uh, by my good friend and colleague and the Johnny Walker ambassador, uh, Ali Reynolds. I'd like uh, Ali, if you're there to, to, to say a few words, please. Yeah. Hey, Colin, how are you doing? Um, hello Fantastic. to everyone on the line. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and thank you so much for joining uh, our special releases 2020 tasting. Um, as Johnny Walker ambassador, I, I, I get to obviously uh, mess around with the wonderful delights of Johnny Walker and the, the blends we release, but every once in a while, um, a good colleague like Colin will invite me along to something like this. So it's uh, as much of a pleasure to be here as I'm sure it is for you guys. Um, Colin asked me to come on for this uh, pairing uh, solely because Cardu is quite close to my heart, working for Johnny Walker. It's the first distillery Johnny Walker purchased in 1893. And it's really been the backbone and the kind of home of Johnny Walker for the last few years um, until later next year, we open um, Johnny Walker Princess Street. So for me, Colin, um, looking at this Cardu 11 at 56%, um, it was super fresh when I first tried it. It's got a hell of a lot of lemon zest and fresh cut grass and it and compared to the regular cardus that maybe i'm used to um the 12 the 18 21 it, it kind of misses that toffee apple baked pear note and it's completely citrus and i think as you touched on that use of um fresh casks and and, and new new oak uh which tends to not be used very much in in yeah whiskey maturation, this really does kind of take Cardu back, I guess, uh, if we're saying from light to heavy, it takes it back a, a notch. And I've compared it to last year's expression, which was a 14 year old Cardu, which was actually one of my favorites uh, for the special releases 2019, um, Cardu 14. But this Cardu 11, I completely agree with you. It needs a, a, good, a good dash of water and it does bring out starts to bring out what our blenders look for in Cardu, those wonderful apple notes, the fresh cut grass and pear. Um, but for me, on the finish, it's all, and I can't get it out of my head, it's banana and custard. It's kind of very dry um, fruity notes with a lot of creaminess um, coming through on the end. Thanks for having me on, Colin. And yeah, cheers. excellent. And, and while you're there, um, for everyone, with that Cardu, now this is where the fun bit can come in if you're able to. I've got the second whiskey here. I've got the Cragmore, which is one of my favourites. Um, I, honestly, I think this is one of our um, best kept secrets. We do have a 12-year-old expression. We have a wonderful Distillers Edition expression um, that I'm a huge fan on. A port wine finish. It's almost. It's got a nose like a. It's almost like being in a a shisha bar in the Edgware Road. It's like cherry tobacco on the nose and it's one of the few whiskies that i recommend with um red meat dishes if you're a uh, if you're a lover of that kind of thing um and there has been one or two special releases over the years that i've particularly enjoyed um from from crag and more a 25 year old uh, and a 29 year old in the past but let's forget that when the minute you get into the nose after your olfactory glands have woken up with the cardu, the minute you start getting into this, 
you're going somewhere else. This is like, I've got pure acetone on the nose. I mean, other times I've, I've used the expression uh, nail, nail polish remover or, or nail varnish, but this is definitely singing from that aroma aromatic perspective. And this is what Craig and Moore, in my opinion, does so well. If you're looking at a whiskey that can appeal to your friend or a prospective buyer, a whiskey that is going to draw them in by the fragrance, Quagamore has the ability to do that. This is 20 years of age. Um, it's been put into freshly charred uh, American oak barrels and refill casks. And I think what, what we're starting to get at with this year's special releases is how much the influence of wood is making on this particular, on, on this particular series. It's so, so important that you'll see from some of the other expressions we're trying later, uh, Talisker being played around with in a different cask, Mortlach, et cetera. So with the Crag and Moor, which just from the nose alone um, gets, my, gets my vote, uh, I'm going to add a few drops of water uh, because, again, strength-wise, we're looking at 55.8 after 20 years. It's probably gone into the cask as a new make spirit at 63.5. And over 20 years, it's just dropped around about 8%. I think Crag and Moore ages extremely well. We have released recently an absolutely stunning 48 year old, uh, which is in the um, Primo, I can't remember the, the, the exact title, but we've just released a Primo, Primo and Ultra range, Prima and Ultima range, excuse me. Um, 48 year old and I'm not really into numbers uh, I'm more into taste and flavors and Crag and Moore really does develop nicely so without further ado um, I raise my glass to you the second whiskey of the evening um, is to the Crag and Moore 20 year old I can see why Crag and Moore is the number one choice from other companies who want to put our whiskey into blends. This is the Grand Cru Class A of Speyside whiskies that all the blenders want to be able to get hold of. And I can understand it. I mean, I just got hints there of a little bit of apricot, a little bit of that stewed apple, a little bit of soft leather coming in on the back palate as well. But this is a very, very, very mellow whiskey. And those few extra drops of water has toned down the acetone notes that I got on the nose, that rose carnation kind of edge. But there's still a really good grip in the finish. Really good grip. So if somebody said to me, um, uh, to be or not to be with these two whiskies, that's the question. I would say that both of these, as the first two, it's really down to as you like it. You know, if you are a fan of whiskey and Shakespeare, these two should be playing for a very, very long time. So, Ali, have you got anything to add to the, uh, the Cragamore that we've just tried? I think quickly before we move on to the next two, um, I saw a few comments coming in, but it, it does smell um a lot it smells very heavy at the start um compared to the crag and Moor, but there's quite a fresh finish on it uh, yeah. vanilla cream and fudge someone puts but for me these two are perfectly paired i think i think you've done a good job the crag and Moor, yes it's nine years longer in the cask but it take it for me it tastes like you've taken everything from cardu and just set it alight and let it kind of burn a bit it's it's got yeah. this trying to Car grilled fruit, this heavy wood, um, and again, as someone said, a lot of fudge and, and vanilla. But that that smell is amazing, and as you said, it it ages well. And again, blenders are after it. Even our own blenders, you know, it's an integral yes. part of the green label. So, yeah, you still got all that classic cereal note that Crag and Moore offers, but there's yeah. there's real kind of lovely stewed baked notes in there as well. Uh, Colin, thank you very much uh, for having me on for these two. Um, and so someone mentioned as well the, the PT version from last year, and if there's yes. any more Craggamores in the pipeline, but we'll answer the questions at the end, I think. 
Yeah, I think that last year, actually, it showed the versatility of the distillery, you know, uh, Pete and Cragamore, totally unexpected. Mm -hmm. And it just goes to show that, you know, what's in the warehouses uh, in Scotland, who knows? And for being a, a whiskey ambassador, being able to see these different expressions come out and uh, exude their flavors uh, in so many different ways. Virtually every distillery that we have, all 28, they, they are virtually now families. You know, there is the, the, the top end of the commercial style, but then you have the, what I call the, the children, the family. Um, and naturally they're rare by nature, if you get my drift, and they are all contributing something slightly different. So for all of you at home, uh, thanks very much, Ali. That was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, for, for, for all of you at home, um, I'm very aware of conscious of time. Um, the next two that I've chosen are uh, Pity Vake um, from Speyside and Dalwini from the Central Highlands. Um, so if you're able to, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a few moments to clean your glasses if you don't have them um, so that you can refresh them uh, and also take an opportunity to uh, drink some water uh, to keep your palate ahead of the game or if you've got some oat cakes or some biscuits water biscuits something just to keep the palate going or even a uh, a black coffee uh, a, a, an espresso uh, would suffice so i've chosen these two as a pairing and they're almost opposites and sometimes uh, opposites attract pity vague um, a very very short story the distillery only existed for like 18, 90 years, 19 years, uh, built in 1974, closed in 1993, primarily uh, Justerini and Brooks, J and B, uh, had this built, had this distillery built because of the massive impact of blends on the market. You know, that 360 degree cycle, well, it was round about at 270 degrees, getting to the top of the curve, which basically said, for the, for the blended whiskies at, at Justerini and Brooks, like J&B, one of the most popular in the world, we're gonna need copious amounts of um, light, fruity, citrusy whiskey, which effectively means um, really with the, with the mash tun, uh, making it quite fast with short fermentations will give you that particular style. And I think it's really important for people to realize that Diageo are a blending company that also produce some exceptionally good single malts. And here, what we have with Pity Vake is an example of one of them in the fact that the master blenders up there, uh, the Maureen Robinsons of this world, the Jim Beveridge of this world, the people that you know I hold in the highest esteem uh, for their selection of casks, they go to um, the warehouses they went to the warehouses at Pity Vake and they, they found a few barrels that they thought didn't deserve to go into the blends. They deserve to be released individually. And the, the question they always ask themselves is, right, I think these casks have got a little bit something different. So to that end, let's pull them aside and let's monitor them. Let's see how they get on. It's almost like a, a football manager having a, a reserve team and saying, well, let's see how they do. Let's see if they develop. Let's see if they're big enough to, uh, to join the first team, to come out uh, in their own right. And this happened with Pity Vake. And this, this is our fifth release now in the special releases range. And we've now reached the, uh, the heady age of 30. And with Pity Vake, because it is a light, clean, citrusy, styled whiskey, the wood is all important, i.e. you don't want the wood to mask it. So here we've got first fill bourbon casks. We're enhancing the sweetness. As they, uh, I think the term we used to use was, this whiskey has been aced, accentuated cask enhancement. Sounds like a, a good three words to use. So on the nose, and if any of you are lucky enough to still have the Crag and Moor and the Cardu, pick up the Pity Vake and have the nose. And if you have, just go back to appreciate that wonderful acetone note of the Crag and Moor. And that light spicy note now developing with the Cardu. 
So with Pitty Bake on the nose, I'm going to compare it with a Central Highland whiskey uh, called Dalwini. And some people are quite familiar with the Dalvini, uh, Dalwini 15 year old. Uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of their distiller's edition, uh, which has been finished in uh, Oloroso casks. It gives extra weight, extra viscosity, and it's almost as if I've been transported to Hereth for a few seconds, and I'm sitting at a tapas bar, and that is exactly how I felt, strangely enough, with the Pity Vake. On the nose, very briefly, it reminded me of a Fino Sherry style, quite tight. So comparing the two, the Pity Vake against the Dalwini, you'll see that the first two that we had were quite pronounced. The third pairing of Mortlach and Singleton are quite pronounced. The last pair, the heavyweights, they are really singing the minute you pick up the glass. And these two, though, these two are more delicate. These you have to really take your time with. And this is where, as I said, taking it to the table, um, I would probably serve this up with, again, or suggest a few drops of water. The Dalwini comes in at 51.9, and the Pity Vake, 30-year-old, both of these are 30 years of age, uh, the Pity Vake comes in at 50.8. So without further ado, with the Pity Vake, I'm going to use just a few drops of water, uh, nice and gently poured so that you can literally see, see it mixing with the oils. And I'll do the same as we're here with the Dalwini. And for me, I'm finding that very, very small pairings with whiskies like this can help out immensely. Just up um, the road from where I am at the present time, I found this amazing uh, Lebanese um, shop that's I've fallen in love with their baklavas. So I've got some pistachio, some cashew, some of that lemon sponge cake, uh, and some walnut. The walnut with the singleton is to die for. Um, this particular almond fudge cake also with the Dalwini will work extremely well. Enough of me. Let's get to the tasting. So the first one is the Ghost Distillery. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's liquid history. And I should mention at this point, in this strange world that we live in, there is now what we have called a collectible market. And there are people out there who are interested in drinking and also collecting whiskies from distilleries that no longer exist. And this is one of them. This is from 1989, 30 years later, we get to try it. I know that some of the bars that I'm working with in London town, they now have a, a closed distilleries or ghost distilleries section, just three or four. And I think this would, uh, this would complement that particular range. So hush my mouth, sample. So there's no getting away from it. This is a very light spirit. I did get some tropical fruit notes, a little bit of pineapple right at the beginning. And considering it's 30 years of age, I think they've, this is the master blenders. I think they found the sweet spot between the grain and the wood where it hasn't overpowered the actual barley. It's still there. A little bit of barley sugar coming through, strangely enough. So for Pity Bake, liquid history, 30 years of age, closed space eyed, only open for 19 years, coming in at 50.8. Uh, light, clean, fresh, easy on the palate, and definitely a great example of what they were producing back in the 1980s in space eyed. And a lot of their whiskies were going into blends. So let's compare and contrast with the Dalwini. And straight away, you've got that honeysuckle note. 
that grassy note is coming through. And this is refill hogsheads, refill American hogsheads, barrels that have been broken down in America, shipped over and rebuilt, making them fatter and wider to take in 250 liters of new make spirit. And um, for Dalwini here at 30 years of age, again, can you get that balance? Can you still retain that uh, butteriness, that buttered note that really has that DNA of Dalwini written all over it? And how much does the wood add to it? So on the nose, you still get that classic butterscotch. So let's give it a try. I'm taking, I've taken it down to about 45%. Wow. Minerally effervescent, really pings around that palate. And of the four that we've tried so far, I think the length on this, yes, it's still going, it's incredible length. So it, this one scores for me, not just on the nose, but that finish, that length, where the, um, the American hogsheads are now contributing some of that sweet, spicy note. That's a cracking version of Dalwini. So just to summarize, so far, we've had um, three whiskies from Speyside, one from the Highlands. I honestly think that that Dalwini, that Dalwini freshness has not been cut out by extra time in wood. It's still singing from the hilltops with that creamy sweetness that it's noted for and definitely scores on the length. So I hope you enjoyed being able to compare and contrast these two expressions from Speyside. So I hope you're all doing well out there. Um, I'm definitely getting into it. Uh, we're going to move on to the third set. We okay for time, everyone? We good? So this is where it tends to get quite interesting for people who are looking at whiskies with bigger flavors. You know, it's almost like we've just had the, um, the Riesling and the Gruner Veltliner, and now we're going to move on to oat Chardonnay. We're going to go oily. We're going to go fat. We're going to go big. And um, the two that we're going to compare and contrast together um, are the two remaining space ciders. Uh, we're looking at Mortlach with its very unique individual distillation method. And we've also got the Singleton, uh, one of a triptych of whiskies under the Singleton name. This is the Singleton of Dufton in Speyside. And uh, I think these are going to be very exciting. So if you've got your glasses, um, please pour out, if not already, the Mortlach and the Singleton. And just before we get into um, the first one, the Mortlach, I'd like to bring in... Um, uh, Pierrick, my good friend uh, Pierrick, who's uh, the new Lagavulin distillery manager, uh, who did spend some time at Mortlach. So, uh, Pierrick, if you're there, um, would you like to say a few words about your your time working at uh, Mortlach? Hi, good evening. Good evening, Colin. Yeah, I would love that. Um, when, when I think of Mortlach, so it was a few years ago now, uh, the first image I've got, the picture coming to my mind is that village in the heart of the space site uh, of Dufftown. So the village of Dufftown where obviously whiskey is history. Uh, it's the, the world whiskey capital, they call that uh, over there. So you've just mentioned um, PTV. PTV is actually just next to Dufftown Distillery, just next to Mortlock, just next to Glendalan. So you, there's just whiskey everywhere there. Um, and yeah, I remember like walking to the distillery in the winter time, just under the snow, it was completely white. And you see the steam coming off the, the warm tubs just outside. So the temperature is below zero outside. And as soon as you get closer to the distillery, it starts warming up. You walk into the building 
You've got a lot of different flavors. As you walk through the turn room, it's quite malty, a bit nutty. And then as soon as you come into the steel house, the memories I had from that, it was like my grandma's kitchen. It was like baked dried apricots. It was really rich flavor. So it's something that I usually find in the four shots in other places. But even through the spirit run, there was that, that kind of flavors for me. So something really rich, really warm. Uh, and then looking at the steels, all the steels are different. It's just reflecting the mud process uh, of the, the whiskey making there. It's a very complex process and all, obviously also a very complex whiskey. So yeah, it's a very special place. Well, um, this malt lack is normally my uh, sort of um, midsummer night's dram, really. Um, it, it's got such a unique history, uh, and I could I could talk to you for hours about this particular um, style that's been produced um, for centuries, often breaking new ground in America, uh, and now finding its place again over here in the UK. Um, on the nose, the malt lack, it really is a dense, meaty whiskey, and. If, as I said, if any of you have one of the previous, I'm picking up the Crag and Moor here. Just go back to the Crag and Moor or the Pity Bake. And you get that big earthiness of Mortlach. And what they've done here, and we're talking about cast management, we finished these whiskeys, um, a 21 year old. We finished these whiskies in uh, Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez um, wine casks. And Pedro Jimenez has almost come out of nowhere in the last 10 years. You know, I remember working with Ockentosh and Three Wood, which first included it. And then obviously with Lagavulin uh, with PX. And, and, and I remember thinking at the time, here you've got a, a, a great varietal coming out of um, Spain, Southern Spain that is adding like an illustration to a book to Ockentoshen, which is triple distilled and one of the lightest whiskies around. And then you look at Lagavulin, which is pronounced PT powerful and pungent. And it also adds to Lagavulin. So this, this particular grape varietal, this luscious grape varietal can play in either camp. So in Mortlach, you've already got a meaty, big and bouncy kind of flavor going on with its unique um, distillation process. So really, for me, we're looking at, this is one that I would definitely consider with people who are into cigars, and I've not even tried it, but I can guess if you're looking at Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso on top of that meaty style that almost like Parma ham on the nose with this. It's, um, it's going to add some big flavor. So let's just pick it up. Let's give it a little nose. It's huge. And if you have the singleton poured, I'd love for you to compare. I'd love for you to go compare. Seriously, this is, uh, this is the way. How I get such fun. And straight away on the singleton, which we want to come to, dark chocolate, mocha, it's blistering with it. It's full of it. Oh, man, alive. So serve that up with a double espresso and you're in another world. I'm telling you, that is something else. So let's go back to the Mortlach. So 56.9, big whiskey, non-chill filtered, non-caramelized, as every special release is that is released year by year. So I'm going to add just a few drops. And as I said, luckily enough, there's enough in these uh, wonderful little bottles that we have here that you can come back and, and try it again. I always remember being with um, a guy called Michael Jackson, uh, the writer. And I, I said to him, how do you, how do you analyze your whiskeys? And he goes, I normally taste, uh, particularly cast strength whiskeys. I taste them um, on three different days at three different times and then make a decision. And I get that. 
I get that because sometimes once is not enough. And with Mortlac, it should be three times. If not three, at least 2.81, right? Uh, so let's give this a little try, shall we? So I'm getting a little bit more of that stone fruit note now. There's still that mouth-filling, almost liqueurish mid-palate that's, explode, that's exploding in the mouth. It's a lot fruitier. The sherry notes have definitely brought a, a, a denser, softer, fruitier style from this particular Mortlach. So I've taken it from 56.9 down to about 46, 48. And um, in comparison, this is now moving completely away from the fresh and fragrant end of the whiskies we've tried. We're now getting into whiskies that have got substantially more weight and length. And Mortlach in particular, if you were drinking this neat, Mortlach has an incredible dusty, spicy, all spice, dry finish after that big meaty mouthful. Here, this is Mortlach with one and a half sugars. It's definitely sweetened it up. The sherry notes from Pedro Jimenez have definitely come into play. So let's compare that now. And this was, of these that I tried this morning, <clears throat> this was the only one that I didn't add water to. I honestly thought to myself at 55.1%, um, I would probably need to, but personally speaking, dark chocolate, coffee. Oh, we're definitely going into that late night. I want something to, to savor and linger. So I'm going to try it again at, at neat. So please raise your glasses for a second to the Singleton of Dufton. And this is 17 years of age at 55.1%. And primarily we, we've used to age this uh, refill American oak casks, which I think would have been filled, some of them at least, with, with sherry. Wow, that is something special. You see what I mean now about when you taste these whiskies at cast strength, you get taken to uh, you get taken to another place. Uh, that just about holds its own in the mouth. The coffee and the mocha notes have stayed. They've lingered. They've not disappeared. And what a finish! I mean, seriously, this finish is better than Ronaldo. I mean, this is absolutely top draw. I've got some of that sort of chocolate orange note. Um, definitely that, that the honey note is coming through, but the weight in the mid palate and the finish with that rasping, uh, rasping spicy note. Um, this is a seriously good whiskey. If, in fact, if I had to think back for some of you in the audience there at home, um, this reminds me of, the kind of whiskey that was coming out of Speyside in the 70s and 80s. Big, thick, rich, massive flavors. Back then we were talking about Golden Promise as the barley variety and top quality uh, Oloroso sherry casks from Hereth. Well, it ain't Golden Promise, but those sherry casks from Southern Spain are definitely giving a big, big edge to that Singleton. So the second time that I've attacked it today, uh, and again, it's been neat. I don't think it benefits from water. I think it's, it's, you can get away with it. Um, that for lovers of this style, that richer, more sherried style, 
that more dense, fruity style. These two whiskies, the Mortlach and the Singleton, um, I think really come into play. Um, so if either of you guys out there, um, uh, Jason from Tavisker and Ali, if you've got a couple of words you'd like to say about these two. Um, as I said, we moved into a different territory, a different style. We're now into the bigger flavors. And these two in particular seem to work extremely well together. Ali? Uh, yeah, I think I think for me, I would just say on that singleton, it's it's a clear winner for me out of the eight. Um, it's just got that complexity of kind of rich fruit cake, and it really leads into like a whole load of licorice and, and star anise for me. So it's mm. that wonderful balance between fruity and spicy, which I, I really look for in whiskies. And I was quite surprised um, singleton as a brand, I guess, has a bit of a a muddle, I guess, with being made up of the three distilleries. But mm. you know, it's our it's our biggest our biggest single malt brand, and I think uh, that trying singleton at this strength and uh, the rarity we get to experience right here is unbelievable. But for me, that's a clear winner. I I agree mm. with you as well. It's probably the the only one I wouldn't add water to, or or doesn't need the water. But I've just added a drop now, and it's uh, mm. it's really just kind of opened up that that buttery note. Um, so yeah, clear clear winner for me, the Singleton, for sure. Fantastic, fantastic. I mean, for those of you, and I'm sure you're aware, there are three Singletons that are available out there. The Singleton is a word, and everybody's heard about the word. If you go to the dictionary, the word Singleton isn't in there, but it means the single one. So this is the single one from Dufton. We also have the single Singleton from Glen Ord and the Singleton of Glen Dullen. And each of these three Singletons are distributed to different markets based on the taste profile of that particular continent. In, the, in Europe, particularly the UK, uh, Dufton is the clear winner. And also used a lot in, in cocktails these days. Obviously, easy to say the Singleton Old Fashioned um, is a big kit. And I think what we've shown or what the master blenders have shown by choosing this expression is that uh, it can age quite gracefully with good cask management. So uh, to those of you out there, beware the Ides of Mortlach. You know, this is its time. Um, for me, the Singleton and Mortlach are two of our distilleries that I'm a big fan of. We've got a great range across the board the Singleton 12, 16, and 20, um, particularly the 20-year-old, it's, it's out there. It's so far out, it's in. And then if you look at the Singleton, uh, I'm happy uh, talking about the 12-year-old and the 18-year-old, but this particular 17-year-old limited edition, I think, hits the spot for me. So without further ado, um, we're going to move on just when you thought you'd seen it all. Then came the big ones from Sky, weighing in at eight years of age, matured in a different kind of cask, never before attempted. And in the blue corner, Lagavulin, or as some people call it, Lagavulin, Lagavulin. The hollow of the mill, peaty, powerful, and pungent. Not necessarily in that order. We're going to attack these last two. I've given you just a couple of minutes to get your glasses charged. And what's incredible is, in some ways, we could have done this in reverse. We could have gone from Lagavulin to Talisker to Singleton to Mortlach to Dalwini to Pitty Bait to Quagamore to Cardu. In some ways, you can do that with copious amounts of water. People expect big things from Talisker. People expect even bigger things from Lagavulin. And it's kind of strange to remember that both of these distilleries uh, did not exude their expressions until 1989. What? 
yeah, 31 years ago, they were released commercially for the first time. Talisker and Lagavulin within the classic malts range. Now, there's a whole family of Talisker. And now, there's a whole family at Lagavulin. And we're lucky enough this evening to have with us in this last pairing as such, um, I'm being joined by a good friend, a good colleague, a fellow ambassador. Um, I'd like to uh, open your, uh, I'd like to speak to Jason. Jason, are you there? I am. Hi, Colin. Thanks for- uh, Fantastic. Thanks for Cheers. Well, um, yeah, I guess um, always really exciting to get a new Talisker release. We have a large um, family of different releases um, within the range. Um, 2018, we rela released an eight-year-old as part of the special releases series, and it was incredible to see the reaction to that. People were losing their minds over this whiskey. Uh, it sold out in a matter of weeks, um, and um, you know there was a lot of call for more. Um, last year, the 15-year-old, really, really special liquid. Um, you know, um, first time we've done a 15-year-old, um, all in heavily charred casks, which is really interesting. But this is really exciting being the first ever release with a rum cask finish. Um, and, you know, naturally, Talisker made by the sea and that connection with the Caribbean, you know, the, the maritime, the islands, um, I think it, it, it's a great fit. And, um, yeah, really excited to have this released to the public. You know what, so, Jason, um, if whiskey is the food of love, I say, drink on. So, Man, I, de I definitely, can I, I, can I just say, and I'd like your, your opinion. This morning, when I nosed it, I thought, I've got, I've got rum. I've got rum. Later, I thought I had mezcal or tequila. And I honestly thought, this is a, an unusual Talisker expression, but it doesn't lose the red hot chili pepper kick that it's noted for. Um, so this is a pretty cool version of, let's be fair about it, Talisker way back in the day used to be bottled as an eight year old anyway. So to have that Jamaican rum influence, what do you think, Jason? You know, for me, this, this is a real glimpse into the heart and soul of Talisker. This is, um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough I get to, I've tried um, New Make Spirit regularly, and this is all about allowing that to really shine through. With those less um, years spent in maturation, you're really getting to this, the soul, the core of the liquid. So, yep. you know, um, on the nose. Wow. You know, instantly um, identifiable as Talisker. Salty, briny, savory, seaside. It just amplifies all those characteristics we know from the classic 10 year old. Um, but it's that, that briny maritime character is, is really yep. common. First uh, thought to me was, this reminds me of a, of a, a slightly aged mezcal because it's got yeah. that delicate um, vanillary notes but it's on top of that, that salty, you know, savory smoke. So um, yeah, really, really intriguing. Let's have a little, little taste, shall we get into it? Yeah, absolutely. Tell me when you tasted it yourself, um, do you prefer this neat or with water? I'm um, a huge advocate for, for adding water to anything at this sort of strength. I think at 45.8 for Talisker, we're really lucky because we do get, yeah. you know, a very powerful um, forward flavor. And, and this is interesting to try neat uh, at this strength, don't get me wrong, but bringing the water just, you know, connects you more to, to, to so much more of the body and the flavors that really rounds it out. So absolutely, you know, try it neat, but, but give it a little touch of water. Yeah, that, it's still got that sweet salty note to it. You know, I like it, I like it. Maybe, um, we might have to play around with some Jamaican food dishes to see if we can find a food pairing with this as well. Yeah. Um, everybody every year looks forward. Talisker has grown in stature, in stature in the last few years. It's been a joy to see um, considering 
you know, initially there was the eight, then the 10, and then it's progressed to all the different expressions, including the, the old age statements going up to the 41 year old uh, we released a couple of years, uh, last year. Incredible juice. Um, great experiment, you know, absolutely top draw experiment with uh, Caribbean casks not diminishing what Talisker's DNA is. And I got to say, in all honesty here, the people who are making the choices of these special releases um, are doing a great job. They're playing around here. The wood, the wood is making the impact massively, you know, and um, for Talisker to come out with this little beauty, um, I'm incredibly impressed. I'm going to add again a few drops of water. If you're not used to it, Talisker can can give you a bite. It can, you know, it, it finishes with that real hot pepper chili kick. Well, I think with many of these, and the Talisker in particular, restraint on casks, you know, it's easy to, to try and add too many layers of flavor, but I think it's about um, keeping the heart and soul of the, of the liquid you know, and just adding these new delicate nuances to give you, you know, a slightly different experience. Um, I love that this, the salt and the brine kicks in so much quicker at, at the yeah. actual level. So you sweeten this up front, straight into salty brininess, the chili pepper spice, and then that long lingering smoke with that hint of sort of that pot still rum Jamaican vanilla, which uh, Amazing. I love. Amazing. I still get blown away when uh, I read an article by Dave Broom um, a couple of years ago that he mentioned that the number one selling um, drink with the under 20, 26 year olds, I think it was, in, on the main island of Honshu in Japan uh, was Talisker and soda. You know, Talisker, three ice cubes, highball glass, topped up with um, soda water. And it was incredibly popular. And I don't know what it is at the moment. I think Talisker is having its um, having its moment in the spotlight. You know, um, out of all the range that we've got, and and this newbie that we've got here, it's adding to the um, reputation, if you will, of the distillery. And I look forward in years to come. Um, Do you want to just uh, give us a, a last few words about the Talisker, and then I can jump onto the Lagavulin, maybe? Yeah, thanks, Perik. Um, well, I think we've—I uh, feel like I've really covered it. Um, you know, I, I, I could sit here and talk about it all night, but um, we are short on time, and I'm happy to hand over to you. Uh, if anyone's got any questions about um, Talisker at any time, of course, feel free to hit me up. I'm always uh, keen to to help and share and and um, do some things going forward. So let me know. But um, Perik, take it away. Let's tell us about Lagavulin. Right, brilliant. Thanks a lot for that. Well, so far, I really, really enjoyed uh, all the chats that we had. Uh, it's taking us to travel around Scotland, to be honest. Great names, great distilleries, great whiskies so far. Um, and I'm really happy, obviously, like to finish off with the, the Lagavulin. So I don't know if people can see me. Yeah. <laughs> There's a few, yeah, is that all okay? Good. So yeah, I've just arrived at Lagavulin. So it's uh, a few weeks now. And obviously, it's a uh, an immense privilege and honor. I mean, it hardly gets any better, you know, uh, than working at La Gavulin. So great legacy, great history behind me and great responsibilities going, going with it. So um, on, on the special release, so I've been drinking the La Gavulin 12 for a few years now. And like a lot of people, every year I'm waiting on this to come out again, very curious about what, what's going to, where is it going to be like? And Every year you, you wonder, well, how can it be like much different compared to last year? And again, this year is just amazing what Craig Wilson, our master blender, managed to do. Um, it's a very, very exciting expression again. So last year, there was quite a, an accentuation maybe on, on the pits. It was maybe pittier than usual. So that's anyway the, the way I've, uh, I found it. Uh, and then this year, so we are going to find again, obviously, the pit. It's by, back to the basics a bit, like uh, Jason was describing for, for Talisker there. Back to the basics of Lagavulin. So smoke, obviously, some pitch in there. The maritime, a touch of salt in there. And this time, there's some sweetness that is going to appear as well. I'd say about this whiskey, it's you have to drink it taking your Isla time. So you need to give it time to develop. So when you're going to pour it first in the glass, you're going to have that smoke 
you're going to have, I, I think of a, a barbecue with meat on it. So I've got that thing uh, coming to the end. So it's a bit ashy, really ashy. Um, so these heavy notes are coming first, but as you leave it in the glass, then later on, I came back to that and I had a bit of citrusy, almost a bit of ginger, some spice, some, you know, zesty kind of flavor. And now, just now, so I had the, the, the drum in the glass for about an hour, and we are going on to the vanilla and fudge side of things. So it's really developing as you leave it in the glass. So you really need to take your time with this one. Uh, but yeah, uh, we look at the color. Uh, it's pretty much the same as we had every year. So it's kind of pale, uh, white wine color. If you look at the legs, it's sticky to the glass. So you expect something sweet, but on the nose, it's not very sweet. It's not very sweet on the nose. Smoky, a bit of salt in there, taking you to the sea. And as you go and taste it for the first time, that the sweetness is going to really develop in there. Great, that's wicked. I mean, every time I get to Lagavulin, when I know Lagavulin, it takes me back to the distillery. Um, and I always get this weird tasting mode um, of, of raw meat in a butcher's shop. You know, I grew up in a time uh, in a village where we had a proliferation of butcher shops and uh, that stayed with me uh, 60 odd years later which is quite incredible but there's more sweetness there with it now um, with, with Lagavulin I mean it's complete opposite of the 16 year old and um, nowadays we have an 8, a 9, 11 and here's the 12 and this is consistently every year in the Diageo stable, this is in the Red by Nature um, portfolio, and I can see why, you know. Um, it's a winter whiskey, it's a hip flask whiskey, um, it's not for the faint hearted, it might need a little bit of uh, water. We're looking at 56.4, but if you've got the right occasion with the right person and you want to give them an, an emotional experience. Um, this is it. I call it love of Ulin. You know, forget lag of Ulin. This is love of Ulin. I love of Ulin as the sun goes down. So excuse me one second. I'll try it. Colin, and uh, I guess uh, Pierre, um, the question come up here on the chat, which yeah. uh, I, I don't know who's best to answer this, but with um, Douglas Wood is saying with the large impact Wood is having on different whiskies. Yeah. I think it's time to stop trying to segment the whiskies by region, if you think we're even doing that anymore. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, uh, that's a really good question. And uh, excuse me for not looking at the chat tonight. I've just been concentrating on the whiskies, and I'll answer any questions that, that may or may not be there uh, later. Um, Ali just brought up a, really, a, a good point about regions. I'm, um, I'm working on some menus at the moment for various uh, bars uh, based on flavor. Um, a great example, if I had to use an analogy, um, I, I, I work in London, but most of the people I work with don't come from London. They come from all around the world. So you now can make peated whiskey in space on. You can now make cherry bombs on either. So companies, distilleries have got pretty much, um, they've realized in their kitchens, uh, in their ovens, in their distillation um, stills, they could produce different whiskies, not necessarily um, that you would say is a lowland or a highland or a space island. So yeah. I think it's good to know where they're from, but I don't honestly expect them to exude what was once the main characteristic of that of that region. Have we got um, have we got time for another question? Yeah. Um, maybe maybe for Pierre or, or yourself, Colin, as well, yeah. but. Um, any reason why PX casks have become more popular? Is it is it just due to experimentation or has there been a shortage of other barrels? Um, but we seem to see a lot more of it. Pierre, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy for you to, to go on this one. But the first reason I would say why it's so popular is because it's so good. You know, the quality of the casks. So we are using them primarily for the quality of the casks. Oh. The best thing about the industry at the moment is that we're all experimenting. You know, nobody knew the answers. Nobody knew the answers when they decide to um, 
distill something and create aqua vita. You know, nobody knew the answer that it would some would mature quicker than others. So 10 out of 10 for experimentation, which is going on around the world, not just in Scotland or Japan or in Ireland or America, the four biggest known areas or regions. But you're talking about France and Switzerland, even even in England, you know, with Bimber, etc. People are experimenting more on what they can do. So I honestly think that in years to come, the best part about getting into whiskey and watching the category grow in the 21st century is that we're always changing. We're always metamorphosizing, as Kafka would say, into something different. And I've seen it with Ta in the 25 years in the industry. I've seen it with Talisker and Lagerwood. I've not even talked about blends. You know, we could talk about John Walker and Sons forever and ever with what's happening in their activity. So to, 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 to give you my last words, uh, to be able to, to join you all uh, on a Monday night, you know, um, if I hopefully can leave you a little bit happy, you know, forget Nature Watch, you know, this is rare by nature, you know. And if you liked any of the whiskies and you want to talk some more, you know, please feel free to, to contact your account manager or give myself or Ali or Jason a shout. We're here to support you in these times. We've got eight expressions that put an expression of glee on my face. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, tonight's little segment, uh, which is about to come to a close. And I hope to see you all very, very much again soon. Thank you to Jason, to Ali, <coughs> to Pierre, to my same man here, Shoff, to the people at Diageo who helped to put these whiskies together and create something unique and individual and idiosyncratic. And for myself, thank you for listening and hope to see you all soon. Thank you.